thank you very much for the introduction. And I also want to thank the whole team of the FCDI and Abhinav for putting this together. It's been really interesting and I'm very grateful to be part of this event. Um, I think the event has already been very successful since it definitely has created a dialogue that you guys are trying to establish here. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed yesterday and today is to hear all these different uh, angles and approaches and uh, ideas to what the photography of architecture can and should be. Um, interesting considerations, whether there's people in the photos or not f uh, people in the photos, the context, uh, the tone of the sky. And as, I, as I'm hearing all this, of course, I could relate to it because I am, like uh, somebody mentioned before, one of these immigrant, Im uh, architect that migrated to photography. So I very much know where people are coming from when they are talking about that. But in my own angle to photography, I think is a little bit different. Uh, I think that we relate to architecture in many different ways and different scales. There's a scale that is, you know, the context, uh, it's like a drone photography or the urban object where there's a street view photography. But I'm interested in this very like close relationship with the buildings, uh, the texture of the walls, the, the feel when you're walking through this uh, earth uh, floor here, for example. And, and also this idea, I think it was the French philosopher Jacques Lacan who said that architecture is like music, that it affects you even when you're not paying attention to it. Like, a few minutes ago, we were trying to pay attention, but there was also the club thing thumping outside, maybe around the neighborhood here. And you don't have to be paying attention to the music to be feeling it. And architecture, according to Lacan, has this quality too. Like, we're here in this space, and even if you're not paying attention at the color of the walls or these really intricate uh, openings between the volumes, uh, it is affecting you. It's kind of like feeding how you relate to the space and, and to the place itself. My photography is an attempt to capture exactly that uh, dynamic there, that subjective feel about how we perceive the space. So on that search, often the, the images become very abstract. And so, okay. So the word abstract has a lot of different meanings to it. Um, one of them, and maybe the one that we relate more often, is this idea that is not something real, that is something that uh, eludes a more clear definition. And, but there's also th this other meaning to it, which is an abstract is when you like sum up the, um, the essence of something. And I feel like my work, it combines a little bit of the both uh, definitions of, uh, the, of the word. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit. Um, I did not seek uh, out abstraction in purpose when I first started doing photography. I believe that I uh, arrived at it uh, as I was looking to capture the details of a building. Very early on, my eyes were really attracted to that notion of getting the detail of a building. And the more and more that I focus on that, the image began to be, become more and more abstract. This first image here is, it was actually a building that doesn't exist anymore. And it was the, the roof of this building as seen from the High Line. I believe now it's actually a really high-end condo by Annabella Zeldorf in that site. But at that time, it was just this black tar uh, roof with this, I still don't know exactly why they painted these white things above it. I think there was some kind of a technical reason, but it really looked just like an abstract painting. And, uh, and I was fascinated, this, it was almost like an installation art on this roof. I also think that uh, abstraction uh, has this really interesting mo uh, element of time to it. When we abstract something, it's like we stop that moment. Um, like Cartier-Bresson used to say, the photographer, that decisive moment. But what photography does it free freezes that moment, it captures it, it pauses, but then it also gives it a whole, an additional life to it. It takes that moment 
to have like an endless possibilities and a continuous life throughout. And I think our own memory of um, our thought process and even how we remember things has a lot to do with uh, abstraction. We might not remember a whole conversation we had with someone, but we're gonna remember those little titty bits or words or expressions that somebody had. The same thing like tonight here. We're not gonna remember everybody's lectures, but from each speaker, everybody's gonna abstract a little portion of it that, that uh, you feel more identified with. And I think that's what I try to do with my photography when I look at buildings, to look at this moment that is more like defining and that uh, moves me uh, in a more deeper way. Oops. I'm not gonna read a part uh, of an introduction on a book that I did uh, three years ago that I think really sums up my, my idea about photography and also how I work. There's always time, there's never time, but the camera is always present, working, walking, looking, seeing, clicking, shooting. Sometimes shot in a second, a sight caught before the traffic light changes. Other times carefully thought out, prepared, produced. Architecture made mine, expressive visions of structures that make up our multifaceted and complex built world. The buildings, the photos, the taking of the photos, it all blends in time, creating a new moment that is always new again and different at every new look, as every new glance is a fresh, unlived moment. So now we're gonna look at, at the images, and I'll tell you a bit more about each project. This here is the um, new museum by Sana in New York, and this is definitely one of those that as you get closer, you have one idea of this building from afar, but as you get closer, this material and the way the light interacts with it gives it a very actually delicate feel about the, the volume. And this image is actually between the grid and the material that actually covers the building. This is our friend, Jürgen Meyer, and Metrosol. And it was a really interesting experience because part of my uh, things that I love to photograph is patterns and the play of light in patterns. And that was definitely like a few day to do that and a really interesting project to capture that. And again, it's really interesting how the play of light and shadow there also makes a big difference on how you feel the structure. Sometimes a little bit heavier, other times when the light is more porous, it gives it a more like um, lacy feel and it really um, um, changes the perception of the building. This is one of my most popular images and is actually shot inside the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. This is in Miami, the M Mimo district. This, this is an excerpt actually of a, a section of the book from which I read the introduction now. And this book was actually all about time and architecture, how to express time through architecture in photography. And in this section, uh, Robert Landon, who was the book co-author, wrote about uh, the repetition. The, the, the chapter was called Again, and he spoke about how nothing is ever exactly repeated exactly the same way again. Even if it's, it feels like it is, it isn't. It's a new instant, it's a new moment, and there's always something different about it. And this image is, this series is the same wall photographed at different angles and different perspectives. And it really changes the, the graphics and what the idea is like. This now is in Venice. And this was definitely part of that idea, how Lacan talks about how we perceive things. This was in front a uh, uh, detail of a wall right across from where I was staying. And every morning when I left, I would look at this, and again, it was that idea of 
being perceiving this in a kind of subjective way and not being aware, but knowing that that is informing your uh, perception of the place and entering your visual cortex data bank. This was another uh, really interesting detail too, also in Venice, and like paintings, but it was really just the patina of time and tear and wear from the building. It was a series of panels, almost like um, uh, a triptych. And this is one of my uh, projects that I did, photographing the Farms of House by Mies van der Rohe. This was a really interesting project because I was commissioned to do this right after the state of Illinois purchased the, the house. And they wanted to create a portfolio of new images um, of the house. And we wanted to do a book. But the book could not just be abstract. So we had to try to do something that was both you know, a souvenir that people could take from visiting the house. But I also wanted to do my special take on it and something that the architects would be able to relate to it. So it was an interesting balance of the two of them. So the book has panoramic shots like this that is more like traditional way of looking at the house. But then there's, at the end of the book, there's a whole section of it that is these more like abstract shots that really go to the essence of the design. Like on this one here, how that the two um, planes of the, of the terraces just barely touch the, the pillar and the way the detailing is done, it's almost like it's just magnetic or magically connected to it. You don't see any uh, screws or any hardware at all. It's very uh, elegant. This is the detail of the steps going up. This was at the Salk Institute, and here too, like, ob obviously there wasn't just like, it's a place that lends itself not just for the abstraction, but once you go to the abstractions, it really gives a, like a whole other layer of understanding of that building. I was very fortunate, the weather was really beautiful the two days that I was there, and at the end of the first day, there was this beautiful golden light that was making the travertine piazza really shimmer. There was, there's no Photoshop on this image. This is exactly what that, it, that was. And it really gives a whole other dimension to the design and to the, archi to the architecture. I think it's quite different to perceive that. Oh, no, wait, it's the other one. Than just that. This gives you an idea of the volume of the space. But once you go closer, then I think your, your vision of the, the design is much more complete. And then sometimes the detail also can, you know, uh, address some of the comments before of how people customize and the human element uh, in using the building. Like in this case, you still don't see people, but there's these little details, and this one in particular was fascinating, of someone customizing this poster of Dr. No inside this iconic piece of architecture. And this is a project now that I did, that I, I really enjoyed doing. This was at the, when the Met Breuer reopened in New York City, in where it was before the Whitney. They had this beautiful exhibit of the work of Nazarene Mohammedi. And when I went there to see the building after they had renovated and cleaned it up and uh, restored it to what it was, how it was before, the materials, I wasn't sure how I was gonna photograph the building. Uh, because it was still the old building that was there before. And then I went to look at the work, uh, the exhibit of Mohammedi, and this idea came to kind of draw a parallel between her work and the museum. And these are the images resulting from that idea. And I mixed the, both the images with some of her work. One thing that I discovered as the, my work began 
to become more and more abstract is also that my interest in architectural photography was beyond just the depiction of a building or documenting a building or registering space. It really became also a means of uh, artistic self-expression. And I think this is some of the ideas that this, these photos tell. Th this, this is another one like the, the image of the salt before. This is the San Francisco MOBA by Snoheta. And it's such an interesting project and the way the volume is done and the, the texture, the, the movement on the facade. But once you go up close, the, to see that material in, in, in short distance, it really changes the perception of that building, in my opinion. Because, and not for the worse or better, it's just different, different. Because I think from afar, that building looks like it would be something very smooth and very um, polished. And once you go up close, it actually has a texture that it almost feels like stone. And I was really impressed with how that uh, it, makes, it just makes you relate to the building in a different way. It adds a layer of information about what the design is. This one is the David Ajay's National, National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a really big name and a really wonderful building to photograph as well. Interestingly enough, he actually calls these openings on the facade lenses. So this is the lenses being photographed by other lenses. Now these are some images of New York City. And this building is actually the, the Flatiron Building, which upon doing this investigation of looking at the building closer, I realized that that building, the facade, is not a straight facade. It has this wavy element to, to the design. It's really fascinating. Within that very traditional design. This is Renzo Piano's uh, New York Times building. In Chelsea, the Frank Gehry and the Jean Nouvel. And these are a little bit that idea of abstraction, but taken to the urban uh, scale, where even, even then, it also, I think, informs your perception and relation to the city in a different way. The Chrysler Building. And this is one too that talks, I think, about the idea of time. Uh, a friend of mine had asked me to take a picture at Times Square and when I was visiting before I moved there. And I, I thought, I'm not going to do that. Everybody takes a picture of Times Square. There's nothing new there. Everything has been done, um, except, of course, the Jürgen's uh, ex that wasn't there yet. But then when I was crossing the street, I saw this. And I'm like, OK, maybe there is something here. And I quickly Take, took the camera out, and I just took like two shots, and it became this photo, which I think really speaks about that craziness and that chaotic feel that you experience when you're walking around Times Square. Now, now we arrive at a very special project for me. This is the rooftop of the Hotel Unique in Sao Paulo, designed by the architect Julio Taki. And when I visited this pool, I was fascinated by not just the, the rooftop itself, but the color of the pool. The pool is ruby red. It's really intense. And I was there for a week. So every day that I was at this pool, I saw it with different lights, different atmospheric uh, conditions. And I began doing this essay, um, not sure what I was going to do with it. And then. Right after I shot these images, I was invited to be part of this exhibit in Venice uh, called Time, Space, Existence. And I thought that these would be the perfect images for that because, first of all, the subjective idea of connecting water, this body of water, to this other city that is standing on water. And 
the, the notion too that all these different moments of the same object at different times, so really gave that notion of the passing of time. So this became my project for that, for that exhibit, this idea of connecting these two big metropolis separated by, this, by ocean geography and time connected by this red um, pool. And part of my interest in photography is also the different ways that I, you can apply and, and do photography. So for this exhibit, I covered the whole floor of the room with um, a print of the, of the pool. And then in the wall, there were traditionally hung uh, images. So you would walk into the, into, the wa into the room and as if you're walking on water on this building that is sitting on water. Then this image, by coincidence, uh, the company Laufen, uh, that every year organizes an architecture uh, seminar during the uh, Art Basel. One of the keynote speakers was going to be the same architect, Huyotaki. So they ended up using this image as the image of the event. It was on their invitation, on the posters. It also became the setting where the the panel discussion happened later. It was, it was very exciting. And we also did there an exhibit with some of my images of other pieces by Huyotaki. Huyotaki, he is very much, uh, he always speaks about how the time that it takes for us to perceive a curved line or a straight line in our brain is almost the same time. But the curved line always engages us more because the straight line, we already know where that line is going, but the curve makes us wonder which direction that is gonna go. And whenever he told me that, I thought that is exactly what I'm interested in doing with my, my photography. I mean, I don't care if the line is straight or curved, but I wanna capture that little moment that you get what the design is or that the, the architecture really like touches you. So it's a really, and his, his, his projects are really um, inspiring to try to capture that from. Very colorful, very strong forms too, and there's always an element of surprise on them. Then this is a, a part of my work too, like in this, on this interest in an abstraction many, many times the reflections become a really interesting subject for me. This was in Moscow. In Moscow. This was in a, a, a building in Siegen in Germany. And then this image, I actually ended up creating a f uh, f printed in plexichrome and it became this like floor standing mirror that was part of an exhibit in Design Miami. Oh, this one's out of order. It's also uh, part of the project by Huyotaki. And then we arrive at this, which was uh, one of the most uh, rewarding experiences of, of my career so far. This, this photo was taken at, uh, on the rooftop of a friend's studio in Rio de Janeiro. And when I got up there and I looked out, it wasn't a particularly attractive landscape, but right away, I got a um, view of that glass building and the whole facade of the building, like two thirds of it, was reflecting this favela, like right across the street, or I guess a few blocks away. And my first interest in that image was to do this. I wanted to capture that colors and shapes and craziness that was in the, in the, um, in the facade. That's what really caught my eye and I thought was fascinating. But I also did appreciate the contrast and, the, and the, um, the insight that it gave it into the context and into that city and into that country. So I did end up posting this image on my Facebook page. And Facebook has this thing which not many people know that you can plan your posts there. And I took this photo and I, I, po I put on the schedule for the following week, for Monday, 
or Tuesday, I can't remember. Now, what happened was that that weekend before this image came up in, in Rio, there was a lot of like social unrests. There was uh, several gangs were out in the streets in Ipanema and Copacabana, robbing people left and right. And then there was this whole discussion about what to do about that. Many of these people, of the robbers, were kids. So it had this very intense social dialogue going on. And when the picture came up on Facebook, it was right in the middle of that uh, heated uh, arguments, this, this, these discussions. And all of a sudden, at that point, I think I had about 700,000 followers. And around lunchtime, I, I checked it, and it had already like 800,000, uh, reached 800,000 people. And I was really surprised, like, how can I reach more people than I actually have followers? And then I kept looking at it, and later on, it was like a million and a half. And long story short, at the end, the photo reached almost 5 million people. It got 32,000 shares, um, I think like 26,000 likes, and thousands of comments, and we were really heated uh, discussions on the comment section. It was really fascinating because it's not what my work is set out to do, it's not what I, my intention is, but it was interesting to see that happen as a, as a, uh, a consequence of what I actually in, had intended to do, like uh, an accidental consequence. And since then, I have actually given rice for like five or six different social studies books that wanted to use the picture to illustrate points of uh, discussion on that subject. It was a really cool experience. Now, this brings us to the, um, my most recent project, which is actually a video project. And this, I was commissioned to do 12 video interpretations of these art museums in Switzerland. And the idea, of course, is to express the museum, but in a more unique way, a different way. So with my partner, Axel Stasny, who is a very um, accomplished filmmaker, we spent a month in Switzerland visiting all these amazing museums, and then we created the small social media uh, format of videos of each museum. But then, since I knew I was coming here, we did a special edit that we would like to premiere here that is um, focused on the architecture. It's very self-indulgent in the architecture. There's no art. The art is the architecture. Uh, is the um, uh, paying homage to these designs. And it features the um, Baylor Foundation by Renzo Piano, the Tingley Museum by Mario Botta, and, um, hold on a second, I skipped some here, the Kunstmuseum Basel by Kristen Gantenbein, and what is the other one? The Tingley, the Kunst Basel, and, Centrum Paul Clay, also by Renzo Piano in Bern. So these are some shots of the original videos. And now maybe we can play that video.
that was it. Thank you very much, guys.